Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2021. Uh, I have a special guest for you today. I am particularly pleased to introduce our following speaker. Uh, he'll be kicking things off. He's a multiple return speaker. He typically speaks about fitness, life, philosophy, and if you really want to get into it, he's got a beautiful head of hair, uh, in which I am incredibly jealous of. Uh, he is an outstanding example of what it is to be a man living in today's society, an exemplar of not only philosophy, but fitness, and enacting that through integrity with intent. Uh, may I introduce you to Alexander Cortez. Thanks, Sash. Is that working? Yes. What's up, gentlemen? Nope. Is it, no? Okay. Oh, geez. That's unnecessary. All right. Thank you. All right. We find ourselves at a liminal stage. Uh, I want to thank Anthony for putting this on. I've said this before. But the foresight required to create something where you bring men together and to do it over a decade, knowing you know, whether he fully rise at the time that he created it, but knowing in the future there would be a real need for it, that's a level of perception and discernment that is very rare. So... Yeah, props, brother. I have to use that to you. So we're here now, and the world's changed the past two years, the past year, and you've all seen it change. And everything that is talked about with self-improvement and evolution of the man, it's that much more relevant. It's now real. We're not in a time of comfort. You can afford to be lackadaisical about what you're going to do. So I call this, we have sovereignty, and we have crisis. We have the world that is in crisis, and it's going to be in a state of crisis, a state of change for a very long time. That's not going away. Unfuck yourself. <laughs> I said this about four or five years ago, and it, it kind of took off as a meme. And this idea that if you want to become a man, you're going to have to remake yourself into that man, and it will be on you. You, know, you have guides, you have ghost mentors, you might have someone like myself, or I, I look up to you. That's very admirable. But the work is always going to be on you, and I've reiterated this point over and over again the past you know, five years. You have to find those qualities in yourself and bring them out. They're, they are not given to you. The work is always yours. The stage we're at right now, and I would say all of you qualify as this kind of person, is that if you are autodidactic, you're a self-educated man, you take it upon yourself to do that work, to learn, to become more, you're going to make it. There's this meme online now that I really like, we are going to make it, or you're not going to make it. And there's this growing perception, I think, in the world at large, there's going to be two groups of people. You're going to get dragged, and you're going to get surprised by everything that happens, I can't believe it. Or you're saying that, okay, I need to stay ahead of the situation. I need to have my finances in order, my health, my social networks the people I know, the place I live. I might need to relocate, I might need to move, I might need to change jobs. You cannot wait to see what's going to happen. You have to act ahead of it. If you are going to be actionable, that means acting in the moment. That means being decisive. I've seen so many people now, even within my own group, my own inner circle, where they have just been fucked by the political social changes. They live in Australia, they live in Canada, they live in certain US states. They lost their job, they lost their mobility. They lost their friends, they lost their social network. They've now been shunned because of certain decisions they've not made. They should have acted faster. Hesitation is gonna kill you, and time is gonna keep moving quicker the more we move into the future. If you are still asking how, then you're not gonna make it. With the not gonna make it meme, you know, why is the idea so powerful, you know, specifically you know, on the level of the individual, is that people are now being able to see the consequences of waiting. You know, like I said, said, the consequences of hesitation. You know, I'm always emphasizing all this stuff. You know, for everywhere, a lot of you guys that follow me, some of you are in the inner circle and you, you listen to me all the time. You have to get this in order, this in order. You have to pay attention, you have to pay attention. Discernment, perception, you know, who do you know? Oh, I'll, I'll do that eventually. You, you, you can't, you can't, you cannot wait. You cannot, because it will cost you. 
So where are we going? What's the future going to look like? One of the points I make a lot is that nothing's going to be reversed. Yeah. Because we live in this social media age where, how many social feeds do you all have? You probably have, let's say, Twitter, Facebook, maybe Instagram, Telegram, Twitch, Discord, uh, YouTube, Slack channels. Maybe you have, you know, God forbid, you have Zoom meetings where you have to talk to people and pretend you're being productive in a meeting. Uh, then you have this the journal, internet, you know, the search engines. You have your email inboxes. You probably have three or four different email addresses. You have all these different attention economies pulling on you all the time. And you see these social trends happening 24-7. And they're very rapid. And not all of them are meaningful. A lot of them mean nothing. You see arguments about pronouns. You see you know, these cultural battles. And it seems like we're always on the precipice of something. Like, oh, there's going to be a breakthrough moment. There's going to be there's going to be war. There's going to be a civil war. There's going to be it's going to be what? Nothing's going to reverse itself. A lot of what we see in this sort of hyper reality, it's illusionary. It took let's say our, let's arguably let's say it took 120 years to get to this point, from industrialization, modernization, you know, feminism, communism, you know, the rise of capitalism, the rise of this global economy. And now it's 2021, oh, there's, there's problems. The system isn't working. Yeah, it's not working. It's not working in a lot of ways. Well, what if we do this and we, we what? You, you, re revert, you revert it back to an earlier era? That's not happening. You change it so next year all the problems are gone? That's not happening. If it took a century to get here, it's going to take, let's say, another 50 years to get somewhere else. Are you prepared for a long night? Are you committed to that? Because you're going to have to be. Yeah, this isn't a hypothetical. It's not going to be five years from now and the United States solved all its problems and the world's better and globalization's gone and we're all free. You know, there's, no, there's no more bullshit. That's not happening. It's not. There won't be a civil war. I get asked this question all the time. We think about civil war. There's not going to be a civil war. Why not? Because there's nothing to fight about, specifically. There's no... We, we might have ideological differences, 100%. I think this, I think that. Well, I don't, I don't agree with you. Oh, yeah, that's an untenable gap. It's a chasm. Are we going to create armies and then we're going to fight and then, and then what? It's this romanticized idea that if we just have that final apocalyptic battle and the right people win, well, now the future's solved. It's all great. It's not happening. You know, the Civil War of its, even the United States, that took, you know, the ramifications of that lasted decades. You look at countries that have had civil wars that have broken up, those countries are still broken 10, 20, 30 years later. That's not a situation you generally want to have happen. It doesn't make life better, it makes life wor worse. It makes it more violent. So now you're in a broken nation and now you're, you know, you're having to fight it out for yourselves. Yeah, and maybe you know, 30, 40 years later, your country's finally prosperous. But you have, what, a half a lifetime of trying to make that work? So there won't be a war. There will be a decline. There's going to be a decay. And I say this not to be pessimistic. I know this is starting off like this sounds really negative. You have to take a long game, an eternalist perspective. You have civilizations, they go through life cycles. They rise, they have a period of decadence, and they go through some sort of disintegration. Energy is always going to transform itself. Everything's always evolving. Just because something falls apart doesn't mean that it falls apart forever and it's terrible forever. There's always going to be opportunity in tragedy. There's always going to be opportunity in chaos. If you are a man of action, you can recreate the world that you want. If you are. If. That's a big if. This is what everybody wishes for. We just get fucking violent, and we start just fucking cutting heads. And we all fantasize about this. You fantasize about it, you fantasize about it. I fantasize about this all the time. Like, if I could just, this is, this is gonna be demonetized on YouTube so fast. If I could just kill all the right people and just stack fucking skulls, like, that would just, like, that would warm my heart. Like, I, I fixed it, it's all fixed. Like, this, this pile of fucking bodies, a river of blood. That's not going to happen, unfortunately. I wish, right? I wish, I wish, but it's not going to happen. But you can take that same sort of ethos and spirit and apply it to the world you want to create. This is very symbolic. Uh, and I don't know what specifically this is from. This is probably off Tumblr, whatever. But it's very symbolic. You know, it's this idea that you're going to take a stand for something. This is a moment, though. This is, you know, this is a moment in time, you know, this kind of picture, this kind of image. That'd be very cool if you could actually create that. 
yeah, in reality, it's not going to be a moment in time. It's going to be many moments. It's going to be many years. The most extensive boundaries of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, why did I include this? So people talk about, you know, we're all Americans. People talk about the United States. We think the future of the United States is. The United States is not going away anytime soon. It is the world's biggest economy. It is the economy. The American dollar, USD, is the reserve currency. If you go anywhere in the world, I go to Thailand, I go to Turkey, I go to Dubai, I can go to Egypt, I go, I go many places, and I pull out cash dollars, $5, $20 bills, a stack of cash, everybody wants that. Oh, I'll, I'll exchange, the hustle you rip you off, they all want US dollars. US dollars not going away anytime soon. Like, I don't worry about that. Is inflation going up? 100%. Yeah, money's not even real. Those print more of it, whatever. But is the US dollar going away? No, it's going to be around for a long time. The United States is the best economy in the world to make money, and that's not really changing. The Ottoman Empire, you know, you can't really, you know, I'm not going like, to go through the text by text, but it started around 1300, you know, in this area, and then it grew. And the Ottoman Empire lasted up until the 20th century. About 700 years it lasted. Is it completely gone today? No, it's not. There's a country called Turkey, which you've probably all heard of, the country of Turkey. The country of Turkey is the sort of last final piece of the Ottoman Empire. And it's still a very prominent, powerful country in the region. It never fully disappeared. You know, countries don't disappear overnight. The United States, to make a point, it's not going to go away overnight. It's not going to be 2050, oh, there's no more United States. Now it's what? It's the United, you know, the United Chastain Barbarianism you know, Federalist Republic. That would be amazing. But I don't know how likely that truly is. Probably not very probable. But it's not going away. And I think that's, you know, I took that as an optimistic mindset that, okay, we have this world that we live in that's going to change, it's going to certainly transform, but it's not dissipating. You know, it takes a very, very long time for social systems to fall apart. Yeah, and despite all of the cultural warfare and the dilution of American values, there's still a very strong American ethos and spirit that we are American, we're independent, we fucking live how we want, and I know all of you feel that way, that's why you're here. That's not being crushed. Yeah, that lives forever. The Soviet Union. You know, this is a bit of a reframing. How long did the Soviet Union last? Let's say from Russian Revolution 1917. So it took, what, 1920 to 1980? Took a little over, no, sorry, 1990? Took a little over 70 years for the Soviet Union to fall apart. So Russian Empire lasted about 300 years. Russia's been a country for over 1,000 years. Russia's never going away. It went through a 70-year period of socialism, communism, that wrecked the country, made life miserable for everybody, but it eventually, what happened? It fell apart, there was a revolution. Russia's not necessarily the best, highest standard of living country in the world, but is it a communist country now? No, it, it's definitely not. You know, they were able to you know, see through the bullshit eventually. You know, there was a collective realization that life sucks. We've turned our country into hell. All right, now we need change, you know, however painful it might be. I think the United States is probably in for its own version of this. In parts, you might have free states like Florida, which basically are their own countries at this point. Florida does what Florida wants, it's amazing. You go to California, you go to a blue state, yeah, they're going to impose their version of communism, socialism, and they're gonna make it shitty. And you're gonna, you're, if you live there, you are going to suffer through it. You're just gonna have to deal. You know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, maybe that will change. You know, are you prepared to fight and you know, make a stand for yourself? Flag burning. You know, the flag is a symbol. There's this common reaction on the right, conservatives, whatever you want to call it. You see something that's upsetting. This is upsetting. You know, this is something that you, you want it like this, not that. You see that and you, and you get angry about it. And of course you do. You know, it's violating some sense of value. How are you representing your values in your actual concrete life, though? I make this, again, I make this point all the time. You have things that you believe in. You believe in them fervently. They're, pas they're passions. They're ideals of yours. You, they're close to your heart. Are you making a world with those actual values? Or are you just getting pissed off when you see these things in hyper-reality? You know, the internet, where it's like, how dare someone say that? How dare they do that? So, fucking what? 
so what? You can, I can get online right now and find 10,000 things that upset me. I could spend all day doing that. Or I could come here, I could speak to a room of men, I could get online, I could get into my various communities and I could try to build men up. I can try to create the world that I want. You don't counter destruction with emotional reaction. That's not the appropriate response. You see people doing things you don't like, you see people destroying things you don't like, then you have to build your own. Whether that be yourself, whether that be your network, whether that be your community, you have to build your own. It can't be this continuous cycle of anger and rage and how dare they, and oh, I'm, I'm gonna make this company or this person the savior. They're, they're gonna take a stand. Make your own fucking stand. Your, your life is your stand, your whole existence is your stand. It's not gonna come from the media, it's not gonna come from a politician, it's gonna be you. So then we find ourselves in the sort of heaven and hell, you know, polarized space. You know, we're pulling back, we're pulling forward, like, you know, what do we follow? You know, the better or worse are angels of our nature. One of the you know, foremost qualities of the United States that's declined the last, you know, last 50 years, actually, is this quality of cooperation. You know, historically, if you go back in time, you go back in history, your allegiance I'm going to generalize, but it's, it's directionally true. Your allegiance was with God. It was with the church. It was with this idea that what you do now will have a place in eternity, will echo into eternity. You are living for something beyond your own lifespan. And that lasts, that, that still exists today in some parts of the world. But that formed this sort of bedrock of Western civilization of, all right, I need to be a good person now because what I do will affect my generations to the future. And we see that with art, we see it with architecture, we see that, that when you go to old European, European cities and they're a thousand years old, and you see this was built for people. And everyone that built that, and they never even saw it completed, they're all dead, but they built it for their progeny, for their offspring, for their families, for their culture. They did it to honor God, they did it to honor themselves. They built all that, and it's a spirit of cooperation. It's getting along with your fellow man, it's wanting to help him, it's wanting to build him up, it's wanting to make the world a better place. And then you get to, let's say, you know, America, you know, sort of like the beginning of you know, like the modern era, you know, post-enlightenment, and your allegiance is no longer with God, because God, for better or worse, God's been killed, God's dead. You know, we, live in, we live in a material world now. You know, we have the separation of theology from science. We live in this material world, and now your allegiance is to, to what? It's to the state, it's to your nation state, it's to you know, it's to a country, and countries rise and countries fall, but now you have an identity, you have a label, and you should trust your institutions, you should trust your king, you should trust, you know, not God, but you should trust you know, things that are man-made. And what happens from that you know, over 200 years? Well, we get to this point where we don't cooperate anymore, you know, where people are slaves to ideology. There's no interest in getting along. There's no, there's no interest in building anything pretty. There's not. You know, look, look at the modern world, look at regular American cities. Are any of them attractive? No. Is, look, look at mega churches. 3,000 people, you know, like in a stadium, you know, listening to a pastor, probably a heretic. You know, is that really honoring God? That you're, you know, you're in Lakeland, whatever, Texas, and oh, I'm gonna go to the, the mega church? Yeah, maybe, maybe not, who am I to say? But we don't build anything that way anymore. You know, what do we think of, of you know, being our saviors? Who do, who do we honor? Well, we, we wanna obey the government. We want to think that the government's going to be efficient and solve our problems. We want to believe that the you know, institutions, yeah, this is a joke now, but 10 years ago, if you had said institutions are the worst fucking thing in the world, what, what do you mean? You know, America's built institutions, isn't it? Yeah, well, now they're all corrupted. Yeah. What were we obedient to? We were obedient to things that are man-made. These are not divine creations. They are things made by man and they are flawed. They are the bottom of this picture. And they tell us to join them. They tell us that if you just followed us and you did what we say and you got along and you conformed and you thought the right thoughts and said the right words, well, now, now you're a good person. Now you can be you know, part of our sort of blue church world that we made, this heretical world. You can't agree to that. It's your duty as a man to defy that. The Taliban. This was really cool to watch. This is really cool to watch, actually. When I was watching this, I, I got into contact. 
uh, with a bunch of guys who were in Afghanistan the past so many months, some of whom were in the Taliban, and then I lost all their numbers and accidentally dropped my phone in the ocean, and I don't know where that went, and that's my story. But I was able to talk to a lot of people in the country, and the reality of hearing how this occupied nation that was, had the United States in it for 20 years was able to basically buck off the global homo you know, paradigm and then take over itself again of the, you know, these people cooperating with each other. This is a cooperative st structure. All these guys, they live in that place. They are of that place. They believe in God. Obviously, they're Muslim. Their family has been there 2,000 years. They're not fucking leaving. You know, America had watches. They have time. They're not fucking leaving. You're going to leave first, and then we're going to fix what you did. How are we going to do that? We're going to get along with each other. We're going to start networks. We're going to start cells. We're going to make WhatsApp groups. That's literally what they did. And we're just going to talk. And we're going to figure out plans, and we're just going to wait. And when the time comes, when we see opportunities arise, then we'll take them. We'll capitalize on them. And they did. It took them 20 years, and they did. So now they have their country back. You know, whether you agree or not, maybe you don't like Muslims, maybe you don't like Islam, maybe, uh, maybe you're in the military and this was a very painful thing to watch, but that's their land, that's their place, that's their home. It was never ours. If you cooperate, you can do great things, you can defy, you can literally defy nations, you can defy supposedly the greatest superpower in the world, if you cooperate. Economy versus country. So yeah, what, what does that mean? There's always this question about you know, United States and you know, ways to think about it. I'm, I'm trying to give you guys as many thinking tools as possible. In a country, in a cohesive country, the country is built on this paradigm in which you favor the people in it. This, this is very not, this is not a controversial idea. You know, a lot of countries like in Eastern Europe today, Hungary, for example, Viktor Orban. Viktor Orban wants Hungary to be for Hungarians, basically. The journal policies and the direction of governance is for the people that live there. It's not for people that are not from there. It favors its people. It generally will have some sort of legal system, whether it's codified or not. It's for people and it's, it's by people. If you go back in time to like ancient Babylonia, Code of Hammurabi, you know, like the first recognized legal code, um, it was written by one man. He was the ruler of that region. But legal code, the way it's written, it's to handle disputes between the people that live there. It's to keep the country operating. It's to favor, you know, it's to favor truth. It's to dish out punishment when necessary. It's to be fair. It's an operating system that's designed to, to serve, to, you know, to serve the body, to serve the constituency. You have a shared heritage, you have shared values. This can obviously skew ethnic. You can always you know, make that point. You know, if you go to Thailand, Thailand's for Thai people. Why? Because they're Thai. It's been that way since 5000 BC. But you can also be unified by a shared history, you know, by shared beliefs. United States originally, who was it for? It was for people that wanted religious freedom, they wanted extreme independence. If you come here, that's what we value. If you are of that mind, you'll get along. We don't necessarily particularly care where or where you're from as long as you share the beliefs, share the values, and you buy into the historical mythology that we've created for ourselves. That's a country. You could create your own country if you want to. Maybe not internationally recognized, but if I've made this point many times, and this is kind of slowly in the works within you know, my particular circles. If you get enough people together and you create a community, you take over a county school board, or you know, maybe you just all live in the same neighborhood, you create a culture within yourselves. And that spreads outward. That, that has a very, very powerful effect. You're seeing that already take place across the United States. You know, I came from Calif California. California's fucked. And I, I love California, but California is like a bad girlfriend. A bad, crazy, hot girlfriend that just ruins your life. California's going full communist. I know it's going to get worse. Like, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful state. Most beautiful place in the world, I think. But I can't live there. It's not for people. The governance is not for the people. It's for a very particular elite group. So you go somewhere else. Florida, free state. Half you in here right now are open carrying. You know, or concealed carry. Why? Because you can. It's great. Taxes. There's no state income tax. The general atmosphere. Does it feel like there's a pandemic happening and there's fear? No. You can create the world you want. You can always create. And then you have the shitty economic zones, which is a lot of Western countries at this point. Like Canada's a great example. I love Canada, but Canada's a terrible country. What does it do? It favors production. It's for money to make money. It has global 
homo culture, so long as you buy it, it flies. What does that mean? There is no culture, the culture is consumerism. Yeah, which is really, that, like that's the global order right now. Like what's the great reset? The great reset is to make everything hyper consumerist. Every part of your life from your, kind of even your vaccines at this point, your vaccines, your medicines, your entertainment, your healthcare, your car insurance, all of it, it's all gonna be subscription. Every part of your life will be subscription-based serviced. And you will pay for that subscription to one massive company that's owned by another massive company that's owned by a mega conglomerate. And, you know, and that's, that's the future of the world, supposedly. You know, and you'll own nothing, you'll be happy, you'll just rent everything. That's you know, really what we're up against. You, know, but you, can, you can certainly dive into the occult and say this is evil, this is satanic, and oh, you, you absolutely can. I could rant about that for a long time. But on the surface, what's it about? It's about greed, it's about money. It's about people profiting off of your every second of your existence. You're alive right now? Okay, well if you're alive, you probably, you need some kind of insurance for that. So if you pay, you know, whatever, $99 a month, you sign up, okay, well cool. And you know, we're, we'll make it super cheap and very easy in this very comfortable world where there's no real problems in regards to the hardship. Those that might be coming, but as of right now, like they're not quite there and wolves profit off you your whole life. Peter Turchin, Clio Dynamics, so what, what the fuck's that? No, might be a new word for some of you. If you want to d get into the nitty gritty, and I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of like actual economic statistics because it gets boring, but if you ever wanna get into the nitty gritty of like why does history go into these cyclical you know, patterns, there's this field called Clio Dynamics, and it looks at this different economic realities elite overproduction, you know, power competitions, you know, looking at you know, just, you know, basic you know, income inequality. And if you combine all these different data points, you can actually make fairly accurate predictions. P Peter Turchin, 15 years ago, predicted violence in 2020. He's been very dead on with his predictions. You know, a lot of the, the work I've done, a lot of the personal decisions I've made the last five years in regards to trying to create income for myself online, creating an online business, creating a network, you know, trying to stay ahead of the curve with where I live, with, with what laws I have to follow. It's because of his work. Um, he's written a number of books. Ages of Discord is a really good book. But it gives you foresight into the future. You know, that's, I, I keep emphasizing this again, but like, you don't want to be that guy where it's like, why is this happening? It's happening for a lot of reasons. And nothing in history is random. You know, events are actually easy, easy to predict if you pay attention to the right data points. There is no grand you finding reason. There are many reasons. There's this very human inclination where we want to simplify things, we want to make life you know, singular, very binary. You know, why is this happening? It's because of this. You know, what's happening? Well, it's because there's a conspiracy. This is like, everything is complex. We're dealing with complex systems all the time. You know, one of the precepts of being a man of action is that you make lots of decisions constantly. Why? Because you're living an interdisciplinary life. There's many, many risks and many different possibilities. Which ones are you actually taking? Which ones are you acting on? If you want to follow a pet theory that this is gonna be the story and that doesn't happen, now you're in a situation where you have to recalculate, recalibrate your entire reality. Oh shit, I guess I was wrong, this didn't happen on the time scale I want, or it didn't happen at all. I had this idea about the world, it didn't come to pass. What do I do now? I guess I need to rearrange you know, everything I think. I see this online all the time where people get into these rabbit holes where they want to subscribe to some sort of conspiratorial, conspiratorial you know, whatever, you know, theory, you know, conspiratorial uh, you know, story. And then like they're waiting for it to occur. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, okay, well, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. Oh wait, it didn't happen. Shit. You always have to be calibrating reality. And you have to do that multiple ways. Not one way, not one story. There are two kinds of power. So this is where if anyone wants power, you can get power. Power is available to everybody. There are two ways to think about it where you have hard power. You know, this, is, this is military. This is being able to basically, this is being able to kill whoever you want and get away with it. You know, this, is, this is force, this is kinetic. We're not at a stage where we have hard power so much. Maybe on a personal level within the space that you live in, but obviously there, there's not a Chattistan barbarian army I wish there was. You go, guys, go sign up. Go fight. It doesn't exist right now. So we don't have hard power. You know, but hard power is the way we usually think about power. We think about 
lost. We think about being oppressed. And we've seen this abuse. We've seen people, we've seen countries like China where they're, they're building their hard power. They want to have that military. They want that might to be able to do what they want with that kind of force. You know, the irony to this actually, if I go back, this is actually in a way like hyper-patriarchal. You know, it's like it's, it's a strong, oppressive father where you're going to do what I say, when I say it, however, I, whatever I tell you to do, and you don't have a choice in the matter. You know, and sort of in a weird irony, like the United States is actually a much more masculine nation, and I'm sorry, China is a much more masculine nation than the U.S. is at this point. I don't know why it's skipping ahead. That's, there we go. This is Australia. You can see Australia. This is hard power. Pandemic, people are, this person didn't wear a mask, right? So now they're gonna get you know, handcuffed and beaten and this is gonna protect people and keep them safe. You know, they're exercising hard power. Yeah. And they can do that because the population there, well, they don't have any guns because they got rid of them. And apparently they, they like to follow rules. So no, nobody really makes a fuss about it. Yeah, and they're like, what does that get you? It gets you a literal fucking boot on your neck. That's what that gets you if you follow rules. Most men are weak and beta. How do you get past this? How do you be a real man? How do you be a husband and a father? That has been where we've dropped the ball as men is because we're too acceptant. We're too tolerant. I'm calling for intolerance for evil. We need to be able to properly identify with the definition, what is masculinity? We need men to stand up and do heroic things. Building a, a tribe of people who are of like mind, who you can depend on, who will hold you accountable, who will call you on your BS. I call the official tagline for now with 21 Connection is America's last stand for masculinity. Mm -hmm. I think it is. The event, and it's as a reflection of the manosphere, really. You come out and you consciously attend and start talking with these people because people who are coming here are coming here to discuss big ideas, important ideas. We're not just talking about being masculine, but okay, you've done all this self-development. What are you going to do with it? So China is building up its hard power. China has the manufacturing capabilities. China has that, you know, China might lack resources, but they're basically replacing the United States. Is this a bad thing? I don't, I don't really care so much about China, honestly. You know, what are you doing right now in the United States? What are you doing here in America? You know, you're, you're not gonna go beat a country of 1.6 billion people. If they're gonna be the dominant empire in this century, then they are, okay. You have things like Bitcoin. You have hard money. So I said money's not real. Money's not real. Money's just a mutually agreed upon idea that we, you know, we engage with. But we can almost make it real. We can have something that's not inflationary, finite supply. It can increase in value. Bitcoin's a great way where you can actually assert power yourself because you can completely separate yourself from the financial system almost. You can do business with people whose values you agree with. Because if you're using Bitcoin, we all kind of believe in the same thing. And we don't have to conform to the narrative. You know, this idea that there's rules and this idea that, well, this is what the, this is what the banking law is, this is what legal law, like, no. No, we can actually do this ourselves. And this is open to anybody. So the ability to create your own systems always exists, you know, if you're intelligent enough, create enough, and you know, if you're willing to take a risk. A lot of people think of crypto as this big, you know, it's like, what, what is it? I, I don't know anything about crypto. Well, you can research it, you can educate yourself. It's not a complex idea to think that, what if you got 100 people together and we use our own kind of currency just amongst ourselves? Okay, I could see that happening. Multiply that by a thousand people, a million, 10 million, 100 million, you know, trillions of dollars of value. There's nothing stopping you from embarking from one hard power system into another, into another one that's more to your advantage. You can make the switch. And then we have soft power. Soft power, you have things, okay, Netflix, they just, uh, I guess now they're canceling Dave Chappelle after saying they wouldn't cancel Dave Chappelle. That, that's really important. It's not that important, but it's an example of soft power. Soft power is culture. Soft power is persuasionary. Soft power is the social boundaries and the social conventions that you're supposed to conform with. Yeah. Soft power has a lot of pull, obviously, but you can always defy it. You, you all defied it coming here. You all did. Everyone in this room is probably defying it in some way where you've made separations between people that you agree with and people that you don't, yeah, maybe upon very harsh ideological lines. So you can always make a stand for yourself this way. And most of the power that the United States has at this point is soft power. 
Yeah, the, the president we currently have, toothless. No, really, in reality, like, is Biden a powerful president? No. Maybe in Washington, D.C.? You know, within certain spheres, yeah, no, no doubt about it. But the state of Florida? Is anyone following mandates here, really? Is anyone, is anyone doing what the president says? Florida, West Virginia, Texas? No. We're doing it stuff the way we want ourselves. Our leaders are making their own decisions. The United States no longer has the ability to project hard power abroad or internally. So now it's relying upon soft power and social convention. And certainly some people are going to get dragged and some people might get targeted, but the system is breaking to your advantage. Our lives are shaped by symbols. One of the interesting things about not just Netflix, I could have thrown up 20 examples of global homo companies, Facebook, Instagram, Disney Plus, yeah, whatever other bullshit, yeah. Pfizer. You see the logo, what's a logo? A logo is a symbol. Something that the general right spear has lacked for a long time are symbols. We have the American flag, that's one symbol, but we don't have much else. Yeah, when I was talking with my friend Arthur Kwan you know, about art, about the ability to create art, to create beautiful things, to pull out of your soul something that people look at and they feel, and it inspires and ignites something in them. The general left, the general narrative, they've got a lot of that. They got all the, and, the, and these, these symbols are aligned with companies, obviously. A lot of it's just, it's just logos that you all engage with. They have a lot of that, and that's very persuasive because it seems very omniscient in your mind. So when you see something like, you know, something like Netflix or you know, anything else, it's not just that word, it's not just that company, it represents this whole sphere of soft power, semiotics, symbols always stand for something else. You have to create your own symbols. No. A lot of what I've tried, okay, these are out of order, there we go. A lot of what I've tried to do with my own inner circle is create symbols, give them something to follow. I got this tattoo to my fucking arm right now. I got it from Jack Donovan, strength, courage, mastery, honor. Do I expect everybody to get tattooed? No, but I expect it to mean something when you see it. For the guys in the group, it means something. Even if I go back, where is it? There we go. Chast on barbarianism. That's ridiculous. No, it's not. I have the means to create an entire digital country. I can do that. I can create a DAO. I can create an LLC if I want to. I can create an online community. I can create social conventions. I can create a culture. I can create an idea. I can create a set of ideas, an entire schema operating system of Here's how we're going to live and change the world. And I can pack that into a symbol. I've got 10,000 variations on this fucking thing. You know how many chess and barbarianisms I have? So goddamn many. Most of them are probably made by Devin. And we laugh at this and we're like, oh, that's ridiculous. No, that means something. Because that got a lot of you fit. That got a lot of you in shape. That got a lot of you living your life differently. And now you're going to create a community amongst yourselves. That group of in itself was from a larger group. Create the world you want to live in. Create the networks. Also, this is, this is great. How can you not see this and fucking look at this? Like, Jesus Christ. This guy's having the fucking time of his life. Let me go. There we go. Back. Back. There we go. So as much as I want this to happen, and I don't vote, I don't really believe in democracy as it exists right now anymore, I'd love this to have an insurrection. We'd all love that. I said this before, just show up, just stab, 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 behead, roll the body off. I run shit now. Yeah, we can fight in a pit with sticks if you, you want to argue. Okay, we're not going to get that. We're not going to get that, but we can dream about it. That's fine. That's fine. What we do have is you have all the tools to shape the world. What does the United States have? What does the federal government have that you don't have? Do you have social media? Of course you do. Do you have the means to create your own banking system? You do. Can you create your own networks? Absolutely. Can you arm yourselves? Yourselves? Of course you can. Do you have tools to reach people, to broadcast? Well, let's see, Instagram Live, YouTube. Oh yeah, I do. You have all the power that a media conglomerate has. You have all the power that an individual country has. You can do this yourself. You can create the world yourself. If you want to talk about being a man of action, what can you create? What can you create? You have all of it, you know, so why aren't you using it? What I've tried to do the last you know, five years, especially this past few years, I've tried to create. I've created groups, I've created network tribes, cultures, I've connected with other people. 
You know, and, whether, and there are so many groups now that exist online. They're all valid. They're all useful. What appeals to you? Yeah, one well, of my good friends, Jack Murphy, yeah, Liminal Order, he has a group. I've got my own Aaron Tribal group. Jazz and Barbarianism, its own group. You know, War Room, Tate Brothers, they're their own group. Fratern uh, you know, uh, Fraternity of Excellence, they're their own group. Everyone, every group serves somebody, but what, what, what are they all creating? What are they really doing? They're creating the substrate for a new world. They're doing it themselves. It's men doing it themselves the way that men have always done. They're not relying upon the external order. They're pulling it out of them and their brethren. You can do that. That, in my mind, is what being a man of action is. You know, Mishima from Japan talks about this in a lot of his books, you know, Sun and Steel. The, the dividing moment in his life was when he realized that he had, for his, the first half of his life, he'd been a writer, he'd written books, he'd written novels, he'd been a very intellectual man, he'd been a scholar, he'd been a man of the mind. But then he got to this point, this sort of life crisis, and he realized he's not a man of action. He's very good at thinking. A lot of people are very good at thinking. A lot of the political sphere, the political right, very good at thinking, think pieces, national review. Let's talk about how we got here. You know, let's talk about moving forward. Let's, this is going to be terrible. This, this isn't constitutional. You know, this is a violation of civil rights. Yes, we can comment all fucking day. We can deliver commentaries and missives. It doesn't mean anything unless you're creating something. You're not acting. You're just talking. We have things like Tradcon movement. You know, they want to have this very idolized world, this idolized image, valor, you know, the golden man, this man of virtue, you know, fair maiden, we're going to make a return to the past. This is nice to think about. This isn't a bad mental model necessarily, but this is not complete either. You know, that movement, those kinds of movements, that kind of thinking where we're just going to simplify down to this romantic, romantic little, you know, fairy tale box. And like, that's what will save the world. No, that's not going to save the world. The world is bloody and violent and it's beautiful, and it's complicated all at once. You know, getting a hypothetical virgin wife and then living on a farm, good for you. That's a nice idea. That's great. That's a beautiful life. I won't say that it's not. But that alone is not going to change the direction of history. So you reclaim your values and you live them. And you recognize everything I just talked about, everything that you are going to have happen to you going forward, it's going to be a process. It's not an event. It's not any one thing. It's not a war. It's not one final battle. It's your whole life until the day you die. Are you man enough to create that? I can ask that question, but you are going to be the one that has to answer it. And I will end there. Does anyone have any questions? Take the mic, man. Mic? Yeah, we got a mic. First of all, great speech. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I hear you're not living in the US. Yes. So how is that process for you as far as travel, getting through customs? I don't know if it's obvious, but are you not vaccinated? in order to get through these places with no issues? Did you take the vaccine to make that process easier? And, you know, are you anticipating the difficulty in getting back into the United States, you know, and considering never coming back or staying away for many, many years? Those are good questions. Um, so I was living in Thailand last year. When I returned at the end of last year in December, there were no vaccine requirements at all because the vaccine was just being rolled out. So, yeah, at that stage, it wasn't you know, an issue with traveling. Um, obviously, as that's progressed into this year, some countries flat out require you, like, if you need the vaccine, or we're not, supposedly we're not going to let you in, or we're going to give you trouble coming back in. Um, you know, part of the reason I moved to Florida was because I realized that you know, the United States is 50 states. Each state has its own laws about what it allows to happen in and out. Yeah, and a federal mandate is not a law. It's a mandate. It's just do this. There's no, there's no actual legality attached to it if you really want to dig into that. Um, Ian Smith has you know, explained that many times himself. So my long-term plan was, like, okay, I need to move to a red state where they're not going to obey the mandates at all. 
you know, or they're going to resist them as much as possible, you know, resist any kind of you know, legal onus that way, legal oppression. Um, so if I fly out of Florida and go to a foreign country and come back in, Florida's going to let me in. You know, they might give me trouble, but like, they're going to let me in, you know, being unvaccinated. If I was flying into, let's say, a state hypothetically like California, New York, where they want to follow the mandate, okay, now it's going to be more difficult. So you're going to see a sort of fractitious division of like people moving to places like I did where, why did I come to Florida? Well, zero state income tax, you know, the politics, but also the restrictions around vaccine law, they're probably not going to follow them. Yeah, then you have countries, let's say like Mexico. Mexico doesn't give a shit if you come to Mexico, vaccinated or not. They'll let anybody in. They're not actually following anything. So then for the future, if you're going to travel, then you need to create like basically a network in your, you know, logistically, like, okay, what countries can I go through where I'm not going to have a problem flying in and out of? And there's still loopholes, you know, for people, let's say, like flying from the UK into the United States. Like, I think there's still restrictions in some like EU countries. But if you're coming from Mexico and Latin American countries, there's no restrictions. So I, I think a, a lot of times we assign this mastermind, you know, like galaxy-brained IQ to supposedly the powers that be. That, you know, the whole world's, it's, it's hyper-organized. There's like, you know, there must be this you know, secret group that just runs this and they make everything run so smooth. It's not. The, the, the world, the earth, it's 200 countries. Every single country has its own laws. Every single country has its own systems operations. Some of them cooperate with each other, definitely. A lot of them don't. And no one actually really, literally knows what the fuck they're doing. So, like, you'll have countries that they'll follow the United States. They'll do what the U.S. does or try to. You'll have countries like some of the Nordic countries now where it's like, you know, we just got revolt restrictions. Yeah, not, not everywhere is taken over by this, you know, this dominating culture that we think exists. Some places are actually independent. So, you know, if you're going to, like, map out, like, oh, I'm going to travel, I'm going to live here, I'm going to live there, just start going, like, through the map, map by map. Like, okay, this is where I can travel to, this is where I can travel not. This is where I'm going to live. This is where I'm not going to live. I've told so many people to move this past year. It's, it's just like it's like a tired thing now. Like, oh my, I'm in New York and I'm going to lose my job. You know, when I told you last year to fucking move, yeah, I, I know I did. I said that probably about nine thousand times on Twitter and in the group and in the other group and the DM you sent. Did you move? No. Are you surprised? By what? You've watched it get worse and worse for a year straight, and now, like, now you're surprised by that New York's run by a, a fucking bunch of lackeys? Like, that, that's surprising to you, that they're going to make your life shitty? So be proactive. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Yeah. So thank you for your talk. Thanks. Uh, you specifically mentioned Peter Tillich. Yeah. Who else do you follow and who has influenced you? What are the great thinkers that you think have influenced your line of thought and philosophies? Uh, relevant to, you know, sort of the paradigm we just talked about, uh, you know, Peter Turchin, really excellent for just sort of like future casting, future prediction making. Uh, you know, Cleo Dynamics is, like I said, this, this big field where you just you pull data from everywhere else and, you know, try to create this reality picture. Really excellent. Um, there's a guy recently, he's on Twitter, my, my Girlfriend actually knows him too. I, I, I'm on a butcher's last name. His first name is Balaji. He works in the tech space. Very good futuristic thinker. Um, you know, one of those guys, sort of like you know, like you could say, sort of like you know, tech philosophy. Make this very good ac accurate prediction making, or just you know, theorizing about you know, future of power, soft power, hard power, future of money, future technology. Um, you know, t tech tends to get like a bad rap and like the right spear overall, like fucking techies, but. A lot of techies are actually like pretty kind of conservative, or they're just they're not they're not liberal necessarily, to use that label. And because they literally work you know within these power structures and they've seen the they've seen the abilities that they have, they've seen the reach that they have, they actually have a lot of good insights into how you can use technology to free yourself from the current system. So Balji's a really good person. Um, Nassim Taleb, I read a lot of his work a few years back. Influenced a lot of my a lot of my paradigms on this decision making in general. You know, like things that are considered like, not, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, it would have been considered risky to start your own business, work online. You know, is online business even a thing? Like now it sounds stupid. It's like, of course, you know, there's trillions of dollars that are all exchanged you know, through the internet. You know, but 10 years ago, that wasn't even a thing. You know, being, being an influencer, that's, what the fuck's that? stupid. Yeah, but look at the world that we live in now. If you are an influencer, if you are someone that is known, look how much power you have. It's, it's insane, I find it insane. I can, reach, I can reach millions of people a day. That, that's unheard of throughout human history. 
you know, 100 years ago, five, five years, 10 years ago, you know, for the entire, for the entire, all the epochs of recorded history, to be a known person, to have power, you had to be a king. You had to literally be the, like the ruler of the country for people to actually know your name. Now you can be an individual online. You can speak, you can share ideas, and your reach is literally infinite. There's, there's no upper boundary to it. Um, talking about hyperreality, um, Rene Girard, Mimetic Theory. Uh, I'm, 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 I know I'm jumping around here a whole bunch. But Mimetic Theory, that was, I read the book, uh, Things Hidden Since the Beginning of the World, a, quite, a few years ago. Some of you, maybe one or a few of you, read, read my book review of that. Um, but mimetic theory is sort of like, and this is, this is going off into the weeds, mimetic theory is this, essentially the scientific recognition that human behavior is always imitation. So like I, I could go back through this whole you know, speech I just gave and talk about imitation games. You know, why are we competing with each other? Well, because you're doing something and I want to do the same thing, so we have to keep copying each other. And, you know, and that can spiral off and you know, there's many different versions of that. But Ray Girard, if, once, once you understand mimetic theory and you really start analyzing the world, you see like why certain things happen as they happen. You know, why do you react this way? Why does you know, left and right react that way? Why do political ideologies arise where they're all sort of part of the same horseshoe when they become very reflective of each other? Uh, Mech theory, that was a big one. Um, a guy who's not well known now, but was at one time, Rene Guénon. He's a French philosopher from the mid to late 1800s. He was actually sort of the predecessor to Niche, and he, like, he's not known at all anymore. Um, but he wrote a number of very good books, sort of, you know, sort of predicting like the the modern world and the loss of values. This was in like the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. Yeah, and this, the separation of theology and divinity from materialism and science and the consequences. He was influential. Um, no, who else that's philosophical? I would say Isaac Asimov. So foundation series, psychohistory. That was, at the time that I read it, when I was like, probably my early teens, that made a big, big, big impact on me. This, this idea that you can, again, viewing history in these very long-term stages, having this very long game mindset, and being able to take this sort of collective inter interdisciplinary account of all of it very holistically, and then let's create, you know, and let's plan out 500 years into the future. Like, let's actually do that. Um, it's a really good thought experiment. And I think Isaac Asimov, he detailed that whole process, you know, and created this very compelling narrative around it, as best as anyone ever has. So, I mean, that's, that's everybody that comes to mind. I'm sure there's, there's more if I you know, keep going. No problem. Good question. Yeah. All right. Um, so obviously we live in, a, in an age of information overload and you talked about multidisciplinary analysis and stuff. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on dealing with uh, kind of filtering information these days. Because I feel like a lot of people, especially those prone to neurosis, can kind of get into these rabbit holes. And I'm sure almost everyone in here has been down a rabbit hole where you're just bogged down by information. And I think if you're going to be an influencer, you kind of have to have like systems in place to rapidly filter and not get overwhelmed. So just wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, kind of filtering these days. That's a good question. Um, so the, the popular framing for that is like how you distinguish signal from noise. So a signal being something that carries relevant information, noise being just meaningless information, literal noise, cacophony. Uh, the information filter that I use, or series of filters, actually the, some of the guys here will know this you know, very specifically. It's just a series of questions. And there's about, I think, like five or six questions that I ask. Um, so I'm assessing information. First thing I look at is, you know, does, does this information, does this affect my ability to make decisions you know, in my day-to-day -day life? Like, is this something I need to know or it's gonna make me more situa situationally aware? So like, or is this, just, it's just bullshit. So like a lot of like online stories outrage, like, oh, that, that's stupid, yeah, fuck those people. That has no impact on my day-to-day -day life. Now, maybe it's useful to know if it's going to impact laws, if it's gonna impact social policy, is it gonna impact something specific to like the sphere of where I live or my ability to travel, like, okay. So if it affects my daily life, if, if it affects my mobility, if it affects my ability to, you know, let's say, you know, earn income, if it affects how I need to conduct myself online, you know, it's, it's censorship sensorial related, if it affects you know, maybe my family or my well-being, 
like, yeah, I probably should pay attention to this. You know, so like, you know, when, when like the COVID situation was happening, like, oh, there's all these stories happening. There was shitloads of stories. What was I trying to figure out through all the mess? I'm like, okay, how are countries actually responding? Is it laws? Is it mandates? You know, what are specific counties doing, like where I live? Like, that's what I was really paying attention to. You know, the, the cases and the count number, like, yeah, that goes up and down. Those statistics are going to be skewed, and they're going to lie with statistics all the fucking time. But what's the actual policy that's going to be made off of that? Because that's what's going to affect you. Yeah, that's what surprised a lot of people were living in certain places, and it's like, oh my God, this, these cases, and you know, they're, they're watching these guys talk about, you know, this is really bad, this is the most, this is the Delta, Alpha, Mega, Omega fucking version that's 18, 90,000 percent more infectious than the other version. All right, whatever, like, what's, you know, what's the governor actually doing in regards to, you know, move, mobil movement, mobility restrictions? What's the general trend that's going in? Because that's going to affect you if you live there. So it's really just filtering down like what actually affects you and your ability to act. If it's something that just gets people angry for the sake of getting people angry, and, and you can't really distinguish anything other than just like emotional fury over it, it's probably pointless. And then this is when you realize a lot of just the daily pop culture like Milu that goes on, it might be directionally useful to kind of know about it because you can kind of see where culture's going certainly, but most of the actual stories themselves, it's just bullshit. It's just, it's pointless stuff. It's people in comfortable situations finding things to complain about. So like what actually affects you taking action? Because that's important. And yeah, if it doesn't affect that, then hey, it's just something to know. Good question. Yeah. Uh, five more minutes for questions, it looks like, guys. How you doing, Alexander? Good. Uh, my name's Sean, I'm a part of your group. Oh, Sean, holy yeah. shit, dude. Yeah, how you doing? Fuck, I'm um, happy to see you, cool. Great, great talk, by Thank the way. Thank you. Um, so, I had recently saw your email about Incline Bench. Yeah. And how, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, how you have uh, had to recalibrate. Yeah. Okay, maybe it's not quite, you know, the pinnacle it was before. Yeah. And this led me to another uh, kind, of, kind of way of thinking that I've been kind of mulling through, you know, with the election, with all the craziness that's been going on. How do you handle, or what is your thinking when your mind changes? When maybe you've made a mistake, or maybe, um, you know, something that was you know, a, a foundational belief um, changes. You know, where, where would, I just wanted to hear your thinking on that, you know, where you would go with, with yeah. you know, going from here, going to there. So my thinking process for, for truth, I mean, this is actually like a question of like truth and what is good. Um, I try to have as few beliefs as possible I don't want to have things I like believe in. Like this is uh, this is my opinion. This is what I think. I'm like, I want to follow what is true and accurate, and what proves itself out in reality. So for something like Incline Bench, I'm when I was promoting it, when I'm you know I'm creating this meme even around it, I'm operating under this paradigm of like I believe this is a good lift, and I think it's true that it it does this for your body. It builds the shoulders this way, the chest, you know, so on and so forth. When I'm presented with contradicting information that shows that's really not the case. Like, all right, like, I thought it was, I thought it was good. I thought it was like the true lift, let's say. It was truthful of what I was doing. But can I create an argument for that? Can I logically explain my point? Can I, can I objectively create some sort of logical proof to, you know, to demonstrate the truth of what I believe in? If I can't really do that that well, okay, then maybe this other thing's true. So maybe I need to engage with the truth that way. Um, so I'm always trying to update just what I think about anything. Yeah, but th there are there objective truth, truths in life. I, I mean, this this is this becomes like a God knows this is a philosophical argument about truth. Jesus, um, you could argue about that for a long time. Maybe there's no such thing as objective truth. Maybe there's just only increasingly updated pictures of reality. Yeah, maybe maybe there is objective truth, and that truth is divine, and it's with God. Okay, like you you can argue for that as well. Uh, but when you're trying to change your mind, you just you're always trying to get orient yourself towards what is most true. So having like an emotional attachment to like, well, I really believe this and like it, it, it hurts me, it bothers me to have to let it go. Why should it hurt you? If, 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 it is, if it is true, the truth sets you free, that you should now have more power than you did before, it should be something you embrace. You know, so it doesn't like bother me to change my mind that way. Like there's, I, there's lots and lots and lots of things over the course of my life that I've changed my mind on. I thought this at one time, it seemed true. I watched it work itself out in reality. Oh, it wasn't. Yeah, you know, this is like something for like politics, or like personal beliefs. 
you know, I was raised like, you know, very like Democrat. You know, it was very generic like, you know, blue state Democrat. I went to San Francisco, lived in SF for a number of years, lived in LA. I saw certain beliefs that I have not work in theory. So I guess they weren't as true as I thought they were. Okay, so what actually does work? You know, what creates a good world now and into the future? You know, those things that have worked since, those things are axiomatic that work and they continue to work and they work today and they work tomorrow and they work 20 years from now, that's probably more true. You know, for something like incline bench, like I think this is a great upper chest exercise. I thought that. So I, you know, I did it and you know, I got some muscle growth from it, okay. And then I was confronted with this argument, well, that's not actually true, this works better. Oh shit, okay. Yeah, let me, let me try that, let me engage with the truth, let me actually practice and apply it. Oh, you know what? Decline dumbbell chest press and cable front delt press actually does work way better. It definitely does, okay, so let's go with that, that's more true. Now that doesn't negate something that still might be effective and true to a point, but you know, is it the highest form of truth? No. There's always, you know, there's always something more ascendant that way. Um, so I mean, hopefully that answers the question, but I mean, the best thing I can tell you is just like, don't get, it, don't get too attached to any one thing that you think you believe in. Because at some point it, you will be, either you'll be proven wrong or it will be tested at such a level that you break from your resistance to letting go of it. No problem. That, that, that literally question was about incline bench and that went off in so many directions, wow. <laughs> uh, the guy in the back? Hi, I have, I have a question. Um, how do you overcome shadow banning? Okay, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, I'll go a little bit meta with this one. It's a very common complaint. I, I mean, I see this, and I got to see this on so many accounts. Person A, B, C, I'm shadow banned. You know, this is bullshit. You know, we're fucking being controlled. This is Orwellian. It, it is. It definitely is. Like, shadow banning sucks. You know, censorship, censorship sucks. Like, nobody's denying that there are social controls in place. But, you know, to, if I was to go back 20 slides, you honestly have to approach this like you're living in Soviet Russia. I'm dead serious. Then that's like an ugly thing to have to accept. You have to approach it that way. When Russia was a communist country, USSR, did they still create art? Yeah, Tarkovsky still created great cinema. There was still incredible music that was created. There was still great literature that was written. There was still political and social talk that was contradictory to the social narrative. But you have to, you have to carefully navigate it. I don't see any point, when people start complaining about being shadow banned and it's like, oh, my content's being fucking, whatever, locked or its reach is being minimized, then find a way to be more creative and work around the censors. There's lots of things that I don't directly talk about, but then if people are smart enough and they read through the lines, they're like, oh, I, I know what this guy thinks, I know what he's about. I, yeah, I would love to say shit outright of like what I really think about, you know, let's say, something controversial, I'm not actually gonna say what I think. LGBTQICT++, whatever the hell it is now. I would love to say what I really think, but you know what? That will get me kicked off the fucking air in it so goddamn fast, and I'll never be let back on, and what would be the point? I'm gonna make myself, what, a digital martyr? Yeah, they couldn't handle the fucking truth. No, th the reality is that my viewpoint's not welcome, so fuck off, we don't need to have you on the platform. Okay, so how do I navigate that? Well, let me find ways to say what I think and feel without saying them directly. Let me hint at them. Yeah, let me learn how to speak in code. You know, for people that grew up in the USSR, like they got very used to this, where it's like you develop this very sort of dark sense of humor where you joke about things, you can refer to it, you can critique it indirectly, but you never say it outright in its most plain form. You have to find a way to be creative. So for shadow banning, get creative. You know, fucking poking a fucking hornet's nest and then being surprised when you get stung by it. That, that's not, that's a stupid. You, you knew that was gonna happen. Find a way to slowly, you know, create some kindling around the hornet's nest and then gradually over time, your manage may hopefully to set on fire, but you did it without the hornets noticing you. Hopefully that analogy makes fucking sense. Probably not, anyway. So, yeah. Gentlemen, that's all the time we have. Let's give it up for eight people. Thanks, gentlemen.
This is Will Spencer from the Renaissance of Men here with the New 21 Report and Alexander Juan Antonio Cortez. Good to see you, sir. What's up, Will? What number 21 convention is this for you? I believe this is, let's see, 18, 18, 19. I think this is number four. Number four? Mm -hmm. What did you think about this year's convention compared to years past? It's definitely evolved, it's matured. Um, like the male spear from when it started, let's say like you know, a decade and a half ago. Yeah, if, I mean, if we're being honest, it started out as like guys that want to get girls that yeah. really struggle with that. Okay, and that's, you know, that's a real problem for a lot of men. Um, but those guys are older now. You know, that generation yeah. has, you know, they've aged, like the, the quality of the content has evolved. Um, it's moved beyond obviously just being about getting sex. And yeah, you know, this year was, like it's gotten more mature. This year was probably the most mature by far, mm -hmm. you know, since I started attending this, where the, the quality and depth of conversation, it was, it was political, it was philosophical, mm -hmm. it was much more holistic. Religious as well. Yeah, it was, yeah religious. Uh, yeah, it really covered, covered sort of the breadth of like the human experience, you know, the masculine experience. So that was really cool. Like it was just really cool to see like the conversations I had this year with the attendees and the other speakers were tremendous. Mm -hmm. And you spoke at the 21 convention and the 22 convention, right? Yeah, I did both. What did you speak about at the 22 convention? 22 convention was very tame. I kept it very tame. Mm -hmm. um, since you know, anytime you're a man and like you're addressing a group of women, it, it's a di different dynamic. Right. You know, obviously it is. And I wasn't really sure what to expect. I didn't go in this, you know, pretending like, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to say. Like, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if it was going to be a younger crowd of women, was it going to be older women, was well, it going to be, you know, was it going to be groupies, mm -hmm. was it going to be women that, you know, just really wanted to hear what men had to say, was this going to be research on their part? So, it, yeah, it was like a, like a mixed crowd. And, you know, my, the content of that speech was, like I said, very simple. It was, like, roughly 20, 25, like, journal life lessons for women from, like, paternal perspective, as I called it. A, pater a per paternal perspective. Yeah, paternal right. perspective. Uh, since my audience is obviously predominantly males, mm -hmm. no kidding. It's about 80% men, 20% women. Mm -hmm. But my overall audience is over 100,000 people, so it's, you know, it's, there's around 20, 25 okay. thousand women that they, hear, they listen to what I have to say. And the questions I've gotten the last few years from, from women are really not that dissimilar from men. It's just from a you know, feminine, you know, womanly, you know, lived experience of being a girl. Uh, so I had created like a like an AMA sort of slideshow on Instagram actually mm -hmm. months and months ago where I'd done an, an AMA just for my female followers and I asked them like, hey, what would you like, you know, girls only like ask questions. And a lot of the questions were just, it was like the guy questions, but just like I said, the girl version. This is like they want life advice. I'm 18, I'm 19, I'm 20, I'm mm. 25, I'm, I'm 30, whatever the age. And they're trying to navigate career or you know, finding a, a husband or, you know, their personal struggles with their own you know, maturation development. And there's very little, I think, quality content for women yeah. that caters to that sort of, you know, like actual personal development. Yeah, a lot of it's just yeah. feel good, rah rah kind of There's material. a lot of good stuff on Instagram, mm -hmm. but like it's it's a very limited platform. There's not a whole lot on YouTube. There's mm -hmm. not a whole lot on Twitter. You know, it's, it's mostly on Instagram, but not of the content that's produced by Twenty One. No, and yeah. a lot of it, I, I've I've explored it a little bit, but a lot of it's just like what I call like chick crack. It's like you're amazing, you're a goddess, you're special, you're a queen. Um, yeah, you, know, you you know just because you exist, you deserve to be loved. Mm. Uh, there's nothing very constructive about it. It mm -hmm. just it makes you feel good, but there's no actual direction as to how to improve yourself, change, do anything. Well, when, a lot the, of it. The messaging is that women are perfect as they are, so why mm -hmm. should they need to possibly improve anything, right? Yeah, just just live, and you know, magic happens for you. Right. So yeah, I created sort of like this series of you know, questions and answers about you know, those kinds of topics, and I just put that into the presentation I gave. And uh, it was about like 20-ish, 20 mm -hmm. 25 lessons. It went, it went over well. Like I could probably refine that speech a few times. Mm -hmm. and I, would, I would do it differently if I did it again next time. Uh, but it, the fact that there were women here that actually were receptive to, mm -hmm. receptive to this listening to a man and like wanting to get a male perspective, that was very encouraging. Yeah, many men in fact. Mm -hmm. Did you have interactions with women outside of, uh, outside of your talk? Did they ask you questions? Did they come up and talk to you? I did. I did. Um, yeah, and they're... Yeah, what I told them, like, the, the journey is not dissimilar for men. Like, mm. you know, that's one of the things, like, when we, t we talk about masculine femininity, you know, obviously, there's obvious differences in, one's, in the nature of energy, the nature of masculinity, the nature of being feminine. There are biological differences, like, no kidding. Like, that's all, you know, that's, that's radical, almost, radical, yeah, that's all, very, that's all very scientific, honestly. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's nothing novel about that if you're an objective person. But there's a lot of shared experiences, and, you know, one of the things I was telling one of the young ladies that I was talking to, I was like your process of becoming like a woman, like you're already you're already a woman. Mm. And I tell this to the men, like you're already a man. Like there's not such thing as like, oh, I want to become a real man. I'm like, 
there's a such thing as being a better man. Mm -hmm. There's a such thing as being a more effective man. Mm -hmm. There's a such thing as being better at being a man. But mm -hmm. you're already born a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not necessarily that of in itself that biological identity. Like you don't have to earn that related sure. to title. Like sure. you're a man, you have X Y chromosome. Sure. You're a woman. XX, okay, like you're a woman. Mm -hmm. Now, are you the type of women that you'd like to be you know, living in the life that you want? You know, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But the process of getting there is going to be very individual. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can certainly pull from tradition. Mm -hmm. You can pull from maternal qualities. You can you know, find that type of content. You can you know, model yourself on that. But there's also going to be a mix as well because we live in the modern world. And guess what? Like life costs money. You know, like we're, you're not in a position probably in your 20s where it's like, well, I don't, I don't want to work. Like I just want to have a magical husband that makes you know, six figures a year and live on a farm. Like, that's really nice if that happens, mm -hmm. but the likelihood is you're gonna probably gonna have to date, vet, mm -hmm. be discerning, you know, get some experience this, you know, interacting with men that way. And also you have to support yourself financially. So like, yeah, you do actually need to get a job. Mm -hmm. Like, no, no kidding. Mm -hmm. do you, does that mean that you devote your life to your career for the next 35 years? Maybe not. Yeah, maybe it's more temporal. Mm -hmm. But you do need to work. Right. Like that has to happen. You can't yeah. be lazy. That's the odds are that you're going to have to work. Yeah, everyone that. has to work in the society. Yeah. There's no yeah. such thing as you know, disavowing that and thinking you're going to get away with not doing yeah. it. Um, and that's what I was telling her. Like mm -hmm. you know, so you know, pull from what appeals to you. you know, develop your own individual character. You know, don't try to imitate something just for the sake of imitation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, was, it was a good conversation. You felt like the message landed. Oh yeah, 100. percent What did you speak about at the 21 convention? That was a lot more broad. Um, you know, talking about this past year, uh, coronavirus, pandemic, uh, you know, supply heard, chain breakdown. Sounds like, vaguely familiar. Yeah, this is all very familiar to yeah. us. Like, okay, the world's in crisis. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, it is. Um, how do we make sense of that, and how do we effectively navigate the changing environment? What you know, what thinking paradigms do we need to have? What, mm -hmm. what tools do we need to adopt? Uh, you know, how do we need to position ourselves? And I tried to give a very holistic overview of sort of the reality of living in a liminal time period where there's not going to be a war tomorrow and everything fix, fix, fixes itself. Mm. There's not going to be a savior that appears and, oh, this person's going to right the ship mm. and you know, everything's back to normal. Uh, like you have to prepare, when society is going through a period of decay and it's going through a transformative period, a transformative period you have to prepare for the long haul, you know, the long night, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Like this is going to be a multi-decade experience. Yeah, I use some examples from, from history, let's say like the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire lasted for you know, 700, 600 years. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, so the Ottoman Empire never went away. Today it's the modern state of Turkey. So if you, if you, there, and there are people who have lived in Turkey you know, generationally for probably hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of years. So they, they lived through, their family lineage lived through the rise of the empire, the, you know, the static period, mm -hmm. the decline, the fall of it. Turkey still exists as a country. Yeah. Yet countries don't go away. Um, you know, I try to dispel like these this very low resolution fallacies mm -hmm. that people have. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, well, the United States is going to collapse. I'm like, no, it's not going to collapse. It Co con countries very rarely ever collapse and completely disappear. And not something of this scale. No, not that yeah. scale. Yeah, Russia was a communist country. USSR, so right? Did that, did that collapse? Yeah. Economically, yeah, yeah it, it collapsed. Is Russia still a country? Of course it is, mm -hmm. because the people they're still Russian people, mm -hmm. and it still functions enough that people want to keep it going and mm -hmm. remake it into something else. So the United States 50 years from now will no doubt not look like the United States today. What will it look like specifically? Well, I, I don't know, I can't answer Who that. Knows. Do you need to be prepared for rapid change? Yes, okay, so what does that look like? That looks like having control of your income. Yeah, I, I have this running joke you know, on Twitter and different platforms, and I quit your job and work for yourself. And, and I mean that because mm -hmm. you need to have control over your earning power, mm -hmm. and you have more flexibility running your own business, working especially in the digital online space, living where you want to live, not allowing yourself to be subjugated to bad governance, like why you're going to put up that situation. You're, you're not fighting it. You're basically just a refugee in your own land. Go United States, fifty countries. Go to where you're treated best. Mm -hmm. you know, or you know, go overseas if you if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with doing that. People immigrate for you know, very same reasons historically. Know what your relationships are. You know, create a network. Have friends. Have family. Have an information network where you can use that to accurately navigate the world. Um, that, it's like networked intelligence. And that, that's almost what Twitter is now. Like, mm -hmm. I mean this seriously. People don't take social media seriously, but you should. Mm -hmm. You can connect with people all over the world, over the country, all over different cities, towns, and you can get information, get intelligence, and know what's happening, have the curve. Mm -hmm. You can find people that have very good predictive powers you know, by way of intelligence, by way of field of study, et 
it's like, okay, I kind of have some sense of what's going to happen. I can adequately prepare myself. Mm -hmm. I can change where I live. I know to stock up. I know that not to be in this place and to be in that place. All that's possible for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so I you know, kind of covered that. I threw out the idea of creating cooperative networks of using, using a cryptocurrency. Like you can create your own cooperative networks of basically economies. Mm -hmm. So you can create your own mini economy you know, amongst yourselves. You can transact in Bitcoin or whatever, you know, whatever different coins. Um, yeah, you know, that's not directly, directly traceable, but it's not even about being traceable. It's the fact that you're doing business with people that you know on a transparent network. Mm -hmm. You can sort of bypass traditional banking. If you in the future get debanked, or let's say in the future your you know, the interest rates go ne go negative, and now your your dollars are actually losing dollars, you know, mm -hmm. storing in the bank. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have an alternative. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to think about all this. Obviously, I'm throwing a lot out here, but that's like you, you can't afford to be naive. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the government is not going to fix itself. You're not. No one's going to take care of you. Now, your governor in a lot of states, you know, governors fucked people over, basically. Not your friend. Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Well, it is. So you, know, you have to dispel with this, this shock and like, I can't believe it. It's everything that can get worse will get worse. Every right that can be taken from you will be taken from you. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. It has to be something. It can't just be set in your ass and just and hope it stops because it's not. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's, just to, just to play devil's advocate mm -hmm. for a second, do you think that's kind of black pill thinking? I don't think so. Nihilistic thinking, let's say. Okay. No, I mean, it, this, is, this is being realistic. It's being realistic. Um, the United States is not in a rising, ascending period. That we, that's pretty much okay, mutually agreed upon that. Yeah. So, okay, does that mean, it's like I said, does that mean it's going to fall apart and there's going to be a civil war tomorrow and you know, the electricity is <coughs> going to disappear and go away? No. Grid down, yeah. It just means that you're going you're gonna to live in a society where it's going through social decay. Mm. It's no longer cohesive. Are parts of the country still very high functioning? Absolutely. You can go to Idaho, Oklahoma, you can go to Florida, life, life's normal. Like life is good. Life's pretty life, normal. Yeah, life's great, life's great. Yeah. You would never know anything is wrong here unless you know, maybe you go to the grocery store, it's like, well, wow, food's expensive. Yeah. Yeah, inflation is happening. Okay. People are wearing masks for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah, there are some people still, but life is, is going well. You know, so even in the midst of like this sort of mega reaching you know, narrative chaos, like things still tend to operate. The U.S. is not at some. The U.S. is not at the point of like, let's say, like the Balkan Wars. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, or you know, like that level of conflict where like it just you know, things literally fall apart, mm -hmm. and you're dealing with a social breakdown of like this war and, and rape and like absolutely you know, hell on earth. We're not there, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you will even ever really get there. But not you, widespread. At no, all, yeah. but you will have to deal with you know, government tyranny. You will have to deal with federal incompetence. Okay, so does that mean everything shit? No, and I would I would consider this. Time period in history, because things are falling apart, opportunity is infinite. It's absolutely explosive. Yeah. So um, Ivan Throne says as well. Yeah, you have all the tools. You have all the tools that every major media company has to do anything you want with. You have, like I just said, you have the ability to form networks. You have the ability to broadcast a message. You have the ability to create an email list. You have the ability to curate your intelligence, intelligence and information sources. You have the ability to reach people. You have the ability to do business. You can do anything you want. Yeah, and the barriers to education for anything are like they're not even they're not existent. Zero. Zero. You want to learn something? You want to get in touch with somebody? You can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a, I'm astounded. You know, from people using, you know, like Twitter and LinkedIn, especially like you can get in touch with the world's experts on so many different subjects mm -hmm. and actually have a conversation with them. You know, through messages and you know, learn from them directly. Uh, I mean, that, that's just unprecedented. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the flow of information, the control of information, our ability to you know, leverage our existence. You know, against the you know the vast social order, like it's never been like that in human history ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred for most of human history, hundred years ago, even twenty years ago, to be a known person, to, that to, the idea of like being a known person, creating a network, you know, building your own kind of world. How would you have done that? You know, calling people on the phone, you know, sending, sending yeah, emails, right, right? Like that just that, that was not an idea in the social consciousness at all. That was even possible. Today, anyone can do that. People are doing people are doing it by the thousands every day. Um, because they have the tools, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some of them realize how powerful this is. So, I mean, that like I'm very optimistic about. Like, I just find that extraordinary. Yeah, the, the, the social decay breakdown to solution. Yeah, like you do have to accept at a certain point that not every epoch in human history is wonderful and good, and you know, as I said, ascending. Like, yeah, sometimes things are rough. I, I you can compare it maybe to living through the United States during like 1930s. It's like, wow, this is really shitty right now. Mm. Like, like we it perhaps it'll get better. It does. It did get better, obviously. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was a rough decade. Mm. It was. Fair. Okay. Very fair. So it is. So deal. So speaking of forming networks, you mm -hmm. have your 
inner circle, mm -hmm. and a lot of those guys came together and formed Chadistan. Yeah, and some of those guys were here. What was it like meeting the guys from Chadistan? That was really fucking cool. I actually did not know they were going to show up, mm -hmm. and then when they they basically, I was talking to them last night. They're like, "Yeah, we do, we thought we just kind of surprise you." And who were the guys that were here? Um, Robert was here. Devin was here. KG was here. Uh, Kilo was here. I think uh, Sean. Sean was here. Yeah, yeah, quite a few actually. Yeah, um, and. That was just really cool, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like I, I had very personal conversations with all of them, and you know, thanking me, like, yeah, thank you for changing my life, and that, mm -hmm. and that. like, I mean, you did that, like, but thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it was very gratifying. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, when I started that group you know, over a year ago, it started as sort of like, like a fitness group, and mm -hmm. you know, some guys signed up that I guess you know they liked me, they liked me. It's like, oh, it's a cool guy, okay. Um, but it really demonstrated to me like the power of creating like a network of friends. Mm -hmm. And you know, men, you know, it's, it's a very cliche thing to say, but like iron does sharpen iron. If you get men together and you give them a common cause and orientation to improve themselves and better themselves and develop themselves, like you can do extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the most powerful force in the, the world is a group of men working together, you know, having those kinds of relationships. So, and this is, it's only been like a year. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned a few years from now, like they're, they're going to do, we're going to do cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Did it hit a little different? I mean, obviously you've heard men say to you before, Thank you for changing my life. I mean, as, as the figure of speech, you know, yeah. yes, you did that, but as the figure of speech, like, mm -hmm. thank you for having a positive impact on my existence. Yeah. But did it hit different to meet the men in person that spent over a year with, like, mm -hmm. chatting daily, hun sometimes hundreds of messages a day? Yes. Did it hit a little different? <laughs> it did. It did. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I get messages all the time from guys where they, they got a program or multiple programs from Formula Wild. Like, just, yeah, it's, in, it's in the DMs, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, that, thanks so much, dude. Like, I'm proud of you. That's cool. Yeah. But when you see a guy in person, you're like, wow, like, this really like, changed their soul. It changed mm -hmm. their whole tra trajectory of their life. Like, fuck. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've just come from the gym? Yeah. Obviously. Very. Right. I, I'm, I don't normally <laughs> dress like this, go out like this. I'm not that vain. I came from training. I was, I was with Tanner and Jack yeah. and Arthur. We, we trained shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. What role does fitness play in the life of a man? Fitness can be everything. Mm -hmm. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I, it's almost like a running joke at this point. Like, I, you've probably heard me say this. Like, if I have to tell you that, like, you need to be strong as a man, like, you're not going to make it, right? But, like, you're <laughs> yeah, not. Like, yeah, yeah. No, it's just it's it's a fundamental aspect of male reality. It's it's it is the most distinct characteristic of masculinity, masculine energy, yang energy, that strength is what defines you. you know, hardness, you know, power, you know, kinetic force, like that's masculine. Everybody knows it's masculine. Like we, both men and women intuitively, when we see that, when we witness this, when we witness it, that's powerful. Like that, that is what a man is. So you have to train that, you have to embody it. You gotta embody it. You, know, you lift weights, you do combat sports, you do something that requires you to physically apply yourself and apply your will to reality. You know, like one of the ways I frame the fundamental difference between feminine and masculine existence, men move the world by force, you know, by, by really di by direct action, you know, man of action. Women will the world to move. They do it by soft power, by persuasion, you know, by enticement. It would, it's very, it'd be very disparate for a woman to try to very, you know, kinetically force things to happen. Like that's, that's masculine energy. Mm -hmm. You know, same thing, vice versa. You know, for a man to you know try to be you know, persuasive and use soft power that way, you can, but like it's very Machiavellian. Mm. Yeah, and within obviously, like within both the masculine and feminine, like you, you can do both. Sure, of course. You know, a lot of what soft power is in like the world of you know, like the sort of the shadow world that exists beneath the surface, you know, beyond like the pretense of what is seen is it's manipulation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a Machiavellian manipulation. It's building relationships. It's knowing how to phrase things and use people's emotions and you know form alliances and. Yeah, it's it's men and men obviously do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's there's a sort of feminine dynamic to it, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Like a lot of times for women to be effective in the world today, they have to be more masculine. Mm -hmm. They have to be more direct. Um, but speaking about the characteristics on a very just like pure, you know, you know unmixed, um, you know, homogenous level, mm -hmm. like yeah, strength is masculinity. And masculinity is strength. Those things are operate on a feedback loop. It's virtuous cycle. Yeah, so you gotta work out. You gotta lift weights. You know, like I, I always say that jokingly, but seriously, like, you know, what do I do? I'm like, what's my business model? I'm like, well, I, I tell guys to lift weights, mm -hmm. and that that changes their whole world. It does. Yeah. I mean, it's been very successful. I mean, Fight Club physique. You know. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's just talk a bit about that because you know I think we've spoken about it before. Mm -hmm. Like, that was a huge thing during COVID for a lot of men. Yeah. Like, I mean, it was very derivative. Obviously, you know, Fight Club physique. A lot of guys have seen that movie, but. Yeah. 
And I realized as lockdowns happened, I was like thinking about like, okay, my business, like people are going to work training at home. I'm like, all right, well, this is an opportunity for yourself this year to establish the habit of fitness and health, to train, to get physically in shape. And, and as I kind of talk about in the book, like you have to just dispense with all the fuckery. Mm-hmm. It's like, you're going to see, you're gonna, there's going to be a lot of things in the news that are going to anger you and upset you and you're going to want to argue about it and this is going to feel so important. None of it means shit if you're a fat piece of shit. Mm-hmm. No one, no one cares what you think. Mm-hmm. You're slovenly and you got 28% body fat, BMI is 35. Like, look at yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, what, what is there about you to respect? Nothing. Mm-hmm. So do the push-ups, do, do the workouts, mm-hmm. start training. And, you know, maybe a year from now, like now you're a man with, you're a man of action. Yeah, you're a man of intention. Like, okay. You have, you have, and you have the means now to actually, you know, change your life the way you want. You're not so reactive to everything. Mm-hmm. If you could put anything on a billboard, what would you put on a billboard? That's a stupid question. <laughs> That's a stupid, terrible question. No, I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it's a stupid question. Right? We so, set that up beforehand. Hey, we set that up. We set that up. This is not me being an asshole on purpose. <laughs> it's not me being um, an idiot on purpose. Yeah. So, so we live in this this modern discourse, um, this modern social discourse. Yeah, what we call like you know, global homo, homo culture. Which to clarify for a lot of people, like, what does that mean? It's, it's not global homo culture is not about homosexuality, yes. it refers to global homogeny. So yeah. everything is the same. Yeah. Everything has to be the same everywhere. Everybody has to think the same and agree the same yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's shared values. Through the There's no differentiation. There's no intellectual diversity at all. Yes. That's what global homoculture is. So there's this question I've seen arise. I've even been asked this on podcasts the last so many years of like, you know, if you could put anything on a billboard, what would it be? Like mm-hmm. there's some this universal message that you're going to deliver to people and because you are just so of God that truly you must have profound thoughts in your head and mind and your soul. And, Chad Jesus. You know, share with me like what you would say to people. The I, word I, of Chad Jesus. Yeah, and I, I think it's just contrived bullshit. <laughs> um, you know, human beings are diverse. The world is diverse. There's many civilizations. There's yeah. infinite kinds of people. There are messages that are you know, divine in that they are universal you know, in regards to you know, treating people well, respecting others, you know, people want to love. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a message that you could put on a, a billboard, you know, a commercial billboard, and then, like that would inspire great change? Not really. Lift weights. Lift weights, yeah. Yeah, Unf- unfuck yourself. Oh, that's right. Like, it's very, <laughs> very pithy. It's supposed to be pithy and quotable, and like you're going to put that in your bio, your LinkedIn bio, and it's like, I hate, I hate all that fuckery. So, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put anything on a billboard. Where can people go to learn more about you? What you do? Um, so I have a newsletter that I've operated now for five years. And the newsletter is where I actually hopefully give the impression that I'm an intelligent person. Um, so it, newsletter, it's, e- it's emails, obviously. Um, but that's where I actually do like long-form discourses, missives on you know, a variety of subjects, both you know, fitness and philosophical and intellectual, political, so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, I have my Twitter account, you know, AJA underscore Cortez. Um, Instagram, I, I use Instagram a lot now for sort of like photo essays, which mm-hmm. is really cool. I think Instagram, Instagram is an incredible art medium. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think a lot of people really appreciate it for that, but it is. Uh, yeah, so the newsletter, you know, um, Instagram, you know, Twitter. Uh, and then my, my DMs, honestly, are always open as well. Like I've never actually closed them, so mm-hmm. if anyone sends me a message, you'll probably hear back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the speakers, I think it was Socrates, spoke very highly of your newsletter. It's a great newsletter. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a pretty diverse subject matter. Um, I mean, if I was to recreate the newsletter today, it'd probably be on Substack. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I charge for it, but it's it's free. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's the best place to reach me as well, since I always check those emails and correspond with people. Where can people sign up for that through your Twitter account or for? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, through Twitter account, uh, through this website, Cortez Cortez site. Okay, very simple. Perfect. Thank you, Alexander. Awesome. Thanks, Will. Yeah. Good talking to you. Good talking to you. This is Will Spencer with the Renaissance of Men here with the new Twenty One Report and Alexander Juan Antonio Cortez. Thanks so much.